Well, I think we'll uh, we'll make a start then. Uh, does everybody join, Mark? Do you think? Yes, go for it. I think yeah. Okay. A few people. Well, well, welcome everybody to uh, the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh's talk tonight. Um, here's the agenda. I've just got a few things to say uh, about what's coming up um, before we have the talk tonight. Uh, Randall Stevenson will be talking about comet tales. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail in a minute. Um, for those who are unaware and have recently joined uh, one of our talks, then you, you can find out all about us on our website. There's a whole plethora of information about astronomy and, and how we approach it and uh, learning aids. You can follow us on Facebook um, and on Twitter. And most of the talks that we've had during lockdown are available on our YouTube channel, as indeed this one will be. And coming up <clears throat> on the 2nd of April, uh, we have Dr. John Davis talking about missions to near Earth asteroids. And Ian Smith will be giving a sky in April. We have a historical look back on the 16th of April when Bruce will be talking about the Venus tablets of Amasaduga or Amisaduga. And hopefully we'll have a couple of scope talks from uh, two of our members. And on May the 7th, it's uh, Planet Nine or Planet Nine um, discoveries in the outer solar system. And the sky in May, um, so that's me, Dr. Samantha Lawyer and uh, Alan Pickup are doing the sky in May. And just to break uh, things up a bit, not a Friday, but a Thursday. Austria. Right? Mm. On the 20th of May, Austria, Nigeria, and um, the dark side of the universe by Professor uh, Catherine Haymans from Edinburgh University. And on the 4th of June, we have um, a South African Large Telescope um, by uh, Petri Bicenan, and it's our AGM at the end of that. So, uh, the end of another year from the Astronomical Society's point of view. So with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Comet Tales uh, and Randolph Stevenson, uh, one of our members who just happens to be Emeritus Professor of 20th Century Literature at Edinburgh University. So uh, I'll stop sharing, Randall, and hand over to you. Okay, let me try and share screen. Which is there. Is that um, visible to everybody? Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's fine. But okay. Um, yeah. I'm going to be talking a bit about Thomas Hardy, as you might have guessed from the title. But don't worry if you've never read Hardy's fiction or his poetry or even seen the movies, Death or Far From a Nomadic Crowd, because I hope I'll explain what we need to know as I go along, and I hope also I'll be talking pretty much as much about astronomy as I will about literature. First thing we need to know is that in 1874, in September, Thomas Hardy and his new wife Emma visited Paris for their honeymoon and were thrilled to see the Place de la Concorde first seen by moonlight. But they went on to add with disappointment, Emma in her diary, stars quite put out by Parisian lamps. The Hardys, and Thomas Hardy in particular, were unusually likely to be resentful of streetlights because Hardy was born in the depths of rural Dorsetshire in a village which certainly had no street lamps. He had to walk three miles there and three miles back to school in Dorchester every day. In wintertime, that walk would have been undertaken in darkness. As a result of that, and of an inquiring mind in Hardy as a young man, he was early and very thoroughly familiar with the sky. He was probably the last major English novelist, in fact, to be thoroughly familiar with the stars and constellations. And we see him making use of that right at the beginning of quite an early novel, Far From the Madding Crowd, in which the shepherd Gabriel Oak looks at the dog star in Lord Everin, pointing to the restless Pleiades halfway up the southern sky. Between them hung Orion, which gorgeous constellation never burnt more vividly than now as it soared forth above the rim of the landscape. Castor and Pollux, with their quiet shine, were almost on the meridian. 
The barren and gloomy square of Pegasus was creeping round to the northwest. Far away through the plantation, Vega sparkled like a lamp suspended amid the leafless trees, and Cassiopeia's chair stood daintily poised on the uppermost boughs. What I'd like us to notice about that is not only the thoroughness of the knowledge of the stars and the naming of them, it's the fact that they all must have characters, the Castor and Pollux of a quiet shine, Vega sparkled like a lamp, Cassiopeia stands daintily among the uppermost boughs. These are stars which have a character, they're familiar, they're almost friends. Hardy, on that evidence, unusually familiar with the sky, and therefore, here's the point, unusually attentive and alert to unfamiliar things that turned up in the sky. What were the unfamiliar things in Hardy's sky? Between 1843 and 1882, five, not just one, not just two, but five of the brightest and most major comets in the past millennium, probably, turned up visible in the Northern Hemisphere, often in both hemispheres. Each one of these comets outshone almost anything else that had been seen for hundreds of years. This began with the great March comet of 1843, I chose this picture of it because of our patron saint being Charles Piazzi Smith, and Smith was at the time in Cape Town and produced this rather nice picture of a sailing ship, but of the great comet, which as we can see is not quite as bright as the sun, but is visible actually very close to the sun. I think a, a more telling um, picture from my point of view is that one. That's the Great March Comet showing up in 1843 in Kent. 70 degrees of tail, magnitude of minus 10, therefore nearly as bright as the full moon. And I think just immense. I mean, I really want to pause for a moment and just make us think about that picture, because it seems to me unlike anything any of us has ever seen, and more awesome than any other object appearing in the sky, certainly in my lifetime and probably in the lifetime of most of the people who saw it in 1843. Thomas Hardy was aged only three at the time, but if he had happened to miss that comment, he got plenty other chances fairly soon. Only 15 years later, there was the rather beautiful Donati's Comet, noticeable for its magnificent curved tail. Hardy almost certainly wrote a poem about this comet, and it featured in a great deal of um, the Victorian art, including this rather beautiful painting by William Turner of Oxford. It appeared in, in many paintings at the time and was bright enough actually to, to, to show almost in some early photographs more of that presently. Only three years later, there was the comment which Andrew had in his, his slide at the top of tonight's meeting, this was Tebbit's comet in 18, <clears throat> 1861. It's worth the word about John Tebbit. Tebbit, who discovered the comet, was an Australian amateur astronomer who actually discovered this comet while using an old marine telescope of only one and a half inches aperture. And he discovered it more or less by pottering out his back door, not very far from Sydney, scanning the night sky. And he picked up this comet at the time. Tebbit, by the way, went on to be probably the most famous of all Australian astronomers, so much so he's famous for having appeared with his portrait on their $100 note, there's a kind of fame. There is also, since 1973, a crater in the moon named after John Tebbit, um, just south of the Mary Crisium. I was looking at it on, on Wednesday night, um, not the biggest crater in the moon by any means. More of John Tebbit in a moment, but here was another comet which covered 90 degrees of the sky and with an extraordinary tail too. I think Tebbit anticipated rightly that the Earth would pass through this comet's tail. So this extraordinary effect of striation and divigation in the tail occurred because we were looking at it almost from behind. We were looking at it, as it were, from the end of the tail toward, towards the head of the comet. So another astonishingly spectacular, very unusual object in every sense, unusual even for a comet in the skies of the Northern Hemisphere in, in 1861. Moving on a bit, I wasn't going to mention this one, but again, because of the Piazzi-Smith connection, here is another of Piazzi-Smith's watercolors 
this time of Codger's Comet, which turned up in 1874. Not as bright, not as spectacular as some of the ones I've been showing you, but nevertheless, quite a formidable, interesting comet. I think interesting for us, I would love to know where Piazzi Smith was actually standing when he painted her, when he remembered this picture. One thing that I'm engaged by is Piazzi Smith was very early sensitive to light pollution. You can see the lights of Edinburgh just appearing at the bottom of this picture. And he was also, as we all are, rather sensitive to har coming in. This was a painting or a, or a reconstruction of a vision of the comet on the 15th of July, um, 1874 at 10.30 p.m. And um, Piazzi Smith records that within about half an hour, the har rolled in. You can actually see it, I think, there starting just um, coming up the fourth. Again, very familiar to us about observing conditions in Edinburgh any night. The sky is completely clear in the summer. It's likely to be full of har before you can get very far. Moving on to the next comet, 1881, again, Tibbet's comet. This is quite confusing, particularly for literary scholars, but even for some astronomers. There was a major Tibbet's comet in 1861, Tibbet, who in the meantime had acquired a five-inch refractor, better equipped, discovered this astonishing comet in 1881. From now on, when I talk about Tebbit's comet, it'll be this one I'm referring to. This one appears here in the wonderful image produced by Etienne Trouble, who you probably know was a, a major artist in um, looking, looking at the sky and producing images of it. This image on the 25th to 26th June, the night of, in 1881, looking really fantastic. I want to pause in this comet in, in three ways, really. The first one is very brief, and that's scientifically, it was very important. It was the first comet to be photographed in its totality. Comets before had had their, um, their, their nucleus or coma photographed. This time they managed to photograph the entire comet with its tail as well. It was almost the first comet to be analyzed spectroscopically, spectroscopically, I should say. Not, not quite, can't quite say it. it wasn't quite as harsh, but it was important for that line of inquiry. Two ways I really want to talk about this comet are in relation to Thomas Hardy, whom I'll get back to in a minute, in case you thought you'd run away, but also just to emphasize the effect, not just of this comet, but the cumulative effect of all these amazing things I've been showing you, 1843, 1858, 1861, 1874, 1881, one after the other, these astonishing objects turned up in the skies over Europe, over America, and over the, the Northern Hemisphere. The, the cumulative effects, I think, really cannot be emphasized too, too much that, um, we have to remember this was an age without cinema and television, so that any kind of spectacle, particularly a free show like this, was bound to attract a lot of attention. And in order to try and recover that attention, I found the best means I, I could was looking at contemporary newspapers. In the spring and early summer of 1881, newspapers were already quite interested in astronomy because they were alert to the second transit of Venus, which was due to occur in 1882. The first transit in 1874 hadn't been altogether successfully observed. It hadn't produced the kind of results people were hoping for. So there was quite a lot of discussion in papers, newspapers of astronomy in, in the early part of 1881. Over the summer, over the summer after um, Tebbit's comet appeared, there were at least 2,000 articles in British newspapers, both local and national press, about comets and very frequently about Tebbit's comet. It's really interesting to look at these, and I've had a lot of fun doing so. I'll tell you why in a minute, really. But just to, to start with what is surely the greatest authority of all, which is the Edinburgh Evening News. The Edinburgh Evening News on 24th June, 1881, Pointing out a large comet easily visible with the naked eye is one of those sensations which affect all. I, think that, that's, I want to hang on to that because it's a sense of spectacle, sensation, amazement, astonishment, which I think is really important in, in relation to all these phenomena. Just to back them up, there is a picture of a crowd of, of people, there they all are, looking at a comet, actually Codgeous comet, but you can see 
there is a decent turnout for it. I'll get back to the turnout in a moment. But when I said it was a pleasure to look at um, articles in the contemporary press, none of them, I don't think, gave me more pleasure than this one. Edinburgh astronomers asleep. Professor Piazzi Smith, astronomer royal for Scotland, usually makes observations and readily furnishes the results of these for publication. In other words, he's dead handy for journalists. Accordingly, inquiry was made at the observatory in Carlton Hill this morning, where it was learned that the professor is at present in the continent. Inquiry as to the comment elicited the reply, what comment, and that no observations were taken of it. I think this is great that when Piazzi Smith went his holidays or went abroad in business, all his assistants drank up their Horlicks, drew the curtains and, and, and went to bed and, and didn't bother looking out. Almost everywhere in Britain, as far as I can tell, except on except in Carlton Hill, Tebbit's Comet was an absolute sensation. Here is what one newspaper reported about, um, uh, about the interest in London. The comet is leading to a dangerous decivilization of the social habits of the Londoner. Sitting up at night is becoming universal, and between midnight and one in the morning, when the comet makes its appearance over the horizon, the streets supporting, affording point of view are nearly as crowded as at noontide. The principal grandstands are the bridges from which an excellent view is obtained. That was London, the Glasgow Herald's New York correspondent reported, the new comet is the principal topic of conversation in the United States. I'd love to know how he worked that out and you know, talk to everybody or what. Same report from Paris. For the moment, the great subject of interest is the comet. I also came across a report, which I didn't quote in another newspaper, which was the vice president of the Paris Balloon Society, Mr. Wilfred de Fonvey, went up in the balloon to get a better view of the comet, no doubt avoiding in doing so those street lights which had so irritated the Hardings when they visited Paris seven years before. As a measure of how far the comet, cometography, interest in comets, reflections about comets had passed into popular consciousness, I'm also going to show you a little piece about um, a satiric episode in Parliament in the summer of 1881, which was when um, a member of Parliament attacked Lord Randolph Churchill, who was then a, a distinguished figure in the House, by saying, the noble Lord pursues in Parliament a curse almost as elliptical and erratic as the comet visiting us lately. Nor is this the only point of resemblance between the two. Astronomers tell us that the heavenly comet is entirely without substance, is mainly composed of gas, and is of a levity inconceivable to ordinary mortals. Uh, th this probably sounds very familiar uh, when we think of contemporary parliamentarians. The, the member of parliament went on to hope fervently that Churchill might be speeding rapidly from the space we inhabit to be seen by men of this generation no more. So you could now, in Parliament, you could now, in the press reporting Parliament, make jokes and satirical references, not only to comets, but even to what was astronomically known about it, about them. Astronomers tell us that the comet is mainly composed of, of gas, etc. There is much more evidence I could adduce for that. J.R. Hine, for example, who is a very distinguished um, asteroid spotter and comet spotter in, in the mid 19th century wrote, late 19th century wrote a huge letter to the Times in which he analyzed every single appearance of Halley's Comet right back to Roman times and even earlier. In the letters pages, in the news pages, comets were, were big news, literally, at that point. How did this affect Thomas Hardy? We know that Hardy was already interested in Comet, comets. We know that Hardy was certainly interested in the sky. He too, rather like that member of parliament, uses comets as a handy metaphor. So in Far From the Madding Crowd, Gabriel Oak's rival, the rather gauche farmer, Baldwood, had supported of him that women had been remote phenomena. Comets of such uncertain aspect, movement and permanence, that whether their orbits were as geometrical and unchangeable and as subject to laws as his own, 
or as absolutely erratic as they superficially appeared, he had not deemed it his duty to consider. Um, it's unfortunate he hadn't, uh, as the story goes on. Hardy's own interest in remote phenomena increased quite markedly during the 1870s, possibly after he'd written Far From the Madden Crowd. He was interested in Richard Proctor, for example. He read Richard Proctor's Essays in Astronomy. Proctor was a kind of, I guess he was a kind of 1870s Patrick Moore. He was a popularizer of astronomy, an essayist in journals and in newspapers. But he was also quite a smart astronomer too, I think, but um, he fell out with the then Astronomer Royal, George Airy, if I remember right, about how to observe the transit of Venus. And I think um, Airy actually had to concede defeat and that, um, that, that, that um, Richard Proctor was probably right. Um, anyway, as well as being interested in Proctor, um, Hardy talked a lot to his doctor. Hardy was quite ill late in 1880 and early in 1881, and he was looked after by Sir Henry Thompson, who was as distinguished um, a specialist in kidney stones as existed in those days. He was also quite a distinguished amateur astronomer, so much so that his telescopes and equipment when he was finished with them were actually passed on to Greenwich Observatory. So, so Thompson was a serious astronomer, really, talked to Hardy, presumably they talked about being ill, but they also talked a good deal about the sky and about astronomy. But the really key moment for Hardy, I think, is when he moved into a new house in June um, 1881. He moved into a new house in Wimborne, still in deepest rural Dorsetshire. He arrived on the 25th of June with his wife, Emma, and on that night, on the 25th of June, they stepped out into the garden of their new house and its magnificent conservatory, and they looked up into the sky and saw that. They saw um, Comet Tennant there in the north against the midsummer midnight twilight. Couldn't fail to make an impression, couldn't fail to make an impression on somebody who was already growing an interest about the sky at that time. As a result, Hardy began probably that summer to start thinking about a novel with an astronomical theme. To get more information, he wangled an invitation to Greenwich Observatory, which in those days was not an easy thing to do. You couldn't just turn up <clears throat> as nowadays and pay your, I don't know how much it is at the gate and get in. You had to get an invitation from the Astronomer Royal and, and you had to ask with references Hardy used as references Alfred Lord Tennyson and Thomas Huxley. It's handy guys to have in your CV. Not surprisingly, he was welcomed in Greenwich, got the information that he needed, and went on as a result to write Two in a Tower, this novel. This is my rather um, stanky old Macmillan edition from the 1970s. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I quite like it because that picture, which is a rather insipid cover picture, tells us a lot. There is the ardent but penniless young astronomer, Swithin St. Cleave, um, not yet quite grown up, feet not quite touching the ground. Next to him is Lady Viviette Constantine, who's the local, um, the, the local aristocrat. I think it's interesting that he's looking through a telescope in daylight. I remember a meeting not long ago, someone, Mark, I think, telling us that solar filters were available by the 1880s, which makes this a bit less transgressive than it otherwise would be. Although I do think it's fasc fascinating that Lady Vivian is actually holding a parasol at the time her, her future in Amarata is trying to get as close to the sun as he can. Despite that apparent divagation, they do indeed fairly rapidly become lovers. Um, I'm sure Sigmund Freud would have something to tell us about people who start an affair on top of a tower, but maybe they all start that way. In the novel, it goes on really to be a romance which develops between Swift and, and, and Viviette. That's what it's mostly about. But the astronomical details are crucial. The transit of Venus figures very prominently. Swithin is absolutely dying to go on, on an expedition to take observations, which eventually he does. And the comet that turns up in the course of the action is absolutely crucial. 
uh, really the uh, difference of life and death. Swithin is so keen, he stays out in all weathers, and as a result, he gets extremely ill, mortally ill. What brings him back to life is somebody telling him that there's a comet on the way, and he's so excited, he decides he has to stay alive long enough to see this comet, and he recovers eventually absolutely completely. When the comet shows up, it's described as being a visitant of singular shape and habits, which appeared in the sky from no one knew whence, trailing its luminous streamer and proceeding on its way in the face of a wandering world till it should choose to vanish as suddenly as it had come. So large that not only the nucleus, but a portion of the tail had been visible in broad day. At night, its fiery plume filled so large a space of the sky as completely to dominate it. This comet, in other words, resembles the, uh, Tedd's comet of 1881. It also kind of accumulates all those astonishing comets which had appeared during Harvey's lifetime. So large as to fill, so large a space of the sky is completely to dominate it. Sounds just like all those comets which Harvey had been lucky enough to witness. Notice only, too, that it has an effect on a wandering world. All those crowds that turned up in London are reprised in the novel by the locals, the yeomanry, um, the local farmhands who come to the bottom of Swithin's Tower, hoping very much that he will show them the comet through his telescope. And they remark, they wouldn't let such a fine show as the comet makes tonight go by without peeping at it. Oh, I'd as soon miss the great peep show that comes every year to Greenell Fair as the sight of such an immortal spectacle as this. They're passionate, the local farmhands are passionate to see the comet. Lady Viviette, it turns out, is passionate to see the comet and indeed also to see Swithin. It's the night when they finally deal with the local yeomanry. Viviette comes up the tower to look at the comet. That is the night when they kind of realize their passion for each other. And they be wrong to say they never look back, they look back forwards and sideways, but that's really where their romance is initiated from. Um, this obviously makes Two and the Two and the Tower a very topical novel in itself. Hardy was drawing on the interest that a wandering world had shown in comets, contemporary familiarity, popular consciousness about comets. The story in that way was perfect to be published in 1882. What is so extraordinary is it was actually much more perfect than Hardy could possibly have realized or anticipated. Why was that? Because when the novel was published in a single volume in 1882 in October, having been serialized since May, the biggest comment of all shown up, the one I've been so excited I couldn't bear to tell you about until now, the great September comment of 1882, was possibly the brightest comet in the whole of history. It shone at magnitude minus 17, which is considerably brighter than the moon. There it is in all its splendor, thundering down to the horizon. <clears throat> the only thing that slightly limited its impact, as we can see from the almost setting um, waning crescent moon, it tended to be at its best very early in the morning. So there are numerous letters to the Times in September and October 1882 from people saying, listen, set your alarm clock, you've got to see this, get up, it's really, really worth it. And it was, again, obviously a daylight comet, absolutely dominating the night sky and completely thrilling. Published, of course, sorry, not published, <laughs> appearing shortly after um, Hardy's comet had been published, but presumably adding to its sales. Hardy was already topical in two and a tower in referring to comets, such as people already knew about after the novel came out and this comet showed up, people were going to be more interested still in a story in which comets and astronomy featured. So far, therefore, the story of comets and Thomas Hardy is in the whole one of good luck and without even meaning to, he produced an even more topical story than he could have guessed and that probably helped his sales figures. The use of comets throughout Two in the Tower was a wonderful addition to his plot and a very convenient plot device. Anybody who knows Thomas Hardy, though, will know that 
very few of his stories end happily. And there is also a darker side to what I'm going to tell you tonight. There are less affirmative aspects to the story of Hardy and Comet by some way. One of these is simply the rather ominous role that comets have played in mythology and history. They haven't always been looked upon as happy objects. Indeed, Swithin in the novel reflects on the possibility of a collision with a comet destroying the whole human race. At the time, in newspapers, there were many reports of how the comet in 1881 had excited in some places, old superstitious fears of war, pestilence, famine, hot weather, and like calamities. I don't quite know why hot weather is a calamity, maybe if it's very hot. Um, it wasn't helped by there being a lot of theories going about in 1881 that the world was going to end on the 15th of November. I can't quite remember if I ever knew exactly why they thought that, but an enormous comet turning up in in, in July of that year, obviously added to those old and long-standing fears. They do get reflected in two in a tower. The same local yokels in Yeomanry ask themselves, what do this comet mean? That some great tumult is going to happen or we shall die of a famine? They're answered very quickly and very briskly and rather sadly by somebody who says, listen, God doesn't bother lighting up comets for poor people. Nobody who earns less than five shillings a week needs to worry. Comets just aren't for them. Comets are for the aristocracy. And that way, Hardy, and indeed me personally have answered the question, consciously or unconsciously, was probably following Shakespeare, who in Julius Caesar points out, when beggars die, there are no comets seen. That was a kind of not very welcome reassurance, but people in two and a tower were reassured that the comet wasn't really for them. Newspapers at the time were also anxious to reassure people that there was very limited danger from comets in terms of collision with the Earth. One of those newspapers suggested there is no more reason to apprehend any danger from comets than there is to fear from a collision between a mountain range and the mist which the wind drives against its summits. What um, that member of parliament reported, astronomers tell us that comets are gaseous and of extraordinary levity and completely flimsy. The newspapers agreed with that and believed completely in it. They also dismissed another fear, which was that, okay, comets are gaseous, but what if the gas is poisonous? There was some suggestion from early spectroscopy that comets might contain cyanide, so there was widespread horror that if the Earth passed through a comet's tail, as it had probably in 1858 and almost certainly in 1861, there might be mass poisoning. So people were busy selling comet pills in Paris, for example, to cure the effects of poisoning. The newspapers tended to refer to France in another way, though. They referred to something called comet wine, which was the story that in 1858, when Donati's comet had showed up, there was a fantastic vintage. There was a uniquely great year for, for French wine. That turned out to be the case. So that turned out to be the great hope in Paris in 1881 as well. The Paris correspondent of the Illustrated London News said that gourmands in Paris were walking around with their tongues hanging out metaphorically because they couldn't wait to taste that, that year's wine. I think now looking back, all this seems almost too complacent, anybody um, 25 years later living anywhere near Tunguska, fortunately, hardly anyone did, might have taken a more serious view of collisions with um, cosmic or, or solar system objects. It's interesting to me that during the 1870s, opinion was actually rapidly changing. Richard Proctor knew that meteor showers followed cometary orbits. He particularly recognized that the November meteors followed the orbit of Comet Temple, if I remember right. What he couldn't do was make the connection between comets and meteors directly. It's really interesting how one scientific idea could completely eclipse another. Proctor was so sure that comets were absolutely gaseous that he couldn't see how they could produce solid particles. And that opinion changed, interestingly, by the end of the 1870s, largely under the influence 
of Giovanni Schiaparelli. Schiaparelli, you might know, is the guy who inadvertently made everybody believe there are canals in, on Mars. Um, uh, that wasn't his fault exactly. But anyway, by 1877, when Amédée Guillemin published The World of Comets, he was already suggesting that they, they are particulate in nature, that they contain solid material too. It interests me, I guess, in passing that during the 1870s, as Hardy's knowledge was developing, the knowledge of comets was rapidly expanding and, and becoming much closer to what we understand in the modern period. But in a way, all of that is slightly to one side of the negative aspects of Hardy's engagement with comets, which I mentioned. He was aware of all that stuff, but what really concerned him was not quite that. What is it that Hardy found negative in his views of the sky? It actually goes all the way back to that same Gabriel Oak, the man in Far From the Madding Crowd, who was so pleased to be looking at the sky, as well as admiring the stars and finding them friendly. Gabriel Oak also acknowledged what he called a speaking loneliness. Human shapes, interferences, troubles, and joys were all as if they were not. He found in the sky, <clears throat> in other words, an enormous loneliness and a kind of annihilation of human significance and, and, and um, human importance. They were just dwarfed. They were overwhelmed by, by what was up there. That feeling seems to have grown in Hardy substantially by the time he came to write to an Attar. In his preface to that novel, he explains what he was trying to do was to set the emotional history of two infinitesimal lives against the stupendous background of the stellar universe. In fact, a lot of the time, the novel makes the two infinitesimal lives stand up pretty well against the stupendous background of the stellar universe. But that stupendousness is also emphasized frequently and extraordinarily powerfully. When Swithin, when Swithin is explaining astronomy and the cosmos to Viviette, he insists again and again, nothing is made for man. You've got to get used to human insignificance, yawning spaces, immensities, stars in their inter interspaces, monsters of magnitude without known shape, void and waste places of the sky, deep wells for, the, for humanity, for the human mind to let itself down into, and the whole cosmos is a vast, formless something, infinitely great. This daunting sense of infinitude, of immensity, actually extends a kind of trope that was always there in Hardy's imagination. In The Return of the Native in 1878, not long before, Hardy had been overcome by the immensity of Egdon Heath, Surprising, actually, to anybody from Scotland, they used to larger heaths than they have down there, but he found that huge physical space of landscape and imaginatively awesome and daunting. He also, Hardy, had read Darwin very early and was con as concerned with immensities in time as he was concerned with immensities in space. I'll just report briefly on one of these for a moment, because it's an episode that, that always makes me laugh in a rather grim way. In a novel called A Pair of Blue Eyes, published in 1873, the central figure, a man named Knight, is unfortunate enough to fall off a cliff very, very nearly, and he hangs on by his fingernails, literally. His only hope of safety is that his girlfriend can do something, but there's no help to hand. What his girlfriend actually does is to tear her underwear into strips, knot it together, make it into a rope, lower it over the cliff, Knight grabs it and is towed to safety. This is not to introduce you to the astonishing plenitude of Victorian underwear. It would be hard to imagine a similar rescue occurring in 2021. What is this to something quite different, actually? Even hanging off the cliff, Knight is so fascinated to find a fossil that he thinks all this while he's waiting for the underwear rescue. Trilobites, he says, separated by millions of years, immense lapses of time. Time closed up like a fan before him. He saw himself at one extremity of the years, face to face with the beginning and all the intervening centuries simultaneously. 
I would love to be that articulate if I was hanging off a cliff by my fingernails listening to the sound of, of ripping underwear. Um, this shows us that Hardy, as I say, was as alert to the depths of temporality that were beginning to expand for the Victorians under the influence of Darwin's reading of fossils. But I think for me, it shows that something nevertheless really happened to Hardy with two, two in a town, and I'll say why in more detail in a minute. Those tendencies, those interests in infinitudes of space and time were there, but I think they were enormously extended by his encounter with the sky and what he came to understand about it. <clears throat> and the kind of extension I mean, this is a, a literary bit, so if you want another glass of wine, go and get it and come back. But, but there is quite a key section of its lecture, at least for me. Hardy in the 1880s and 1890s was working on an enormous poem, The Dynasts, about the Napoleonic Wars. Not much read nowadays, partly because it is, I have to say, at times almost unreadable. But interesting, because in it, Hardy finally articulates his view of fate, which was the belief that there is something he called the imminent will, which runs the universe, human affairs, and everything. The imminent will is omnipotent, omnipresent, animate, but completely indifferent to human fate, mercilessly detached from the sphere of humanity. It's almost like the omnipotent God of Christianity, completely purged of benevolence. This dark, insouciant, imminent will inhabits something called the overworld, which sounds very astronomical if we look at it closely. Here's a section from the Dynasts, eventually published 1903 to 1908. The imminent will is described as this viewless, voiceless turner of the wheel. It lends its heed to other worlds being wearied out with this, wherefore its mindlessness of earthly woes. Its furthest hem and salvage may extend to where the roars and plashings of the flames of earth invisible suns swell noisily, and onwards into ghastly gulfs of the sky, monsters of magnitude without a shape, hanging in deep wells of nothingness, far-ranged eons past all fathoming. What's interesting about that, as you've probably detected, because I highlighted the phrase in blue, is that Hardy got the blues the same way in Two and a Tower as he did in The Dynasts. He used almost the same phrases monsters of magnitude without a shape appears in both those works, almost as though Hardy was sitting looking back at two in a tower and thinking, gosh, that was a good phrase. I'll, I'll use that one again. In other words, Hardy's, in some ways, thought to be greatest work, not now, but at the time it was for him his major work, owed an odd, daunting view of the cosmos to lessons which seem to me to extend very exactly from his experience of astronomy as it's reflected in two and a tower, and by extension from his experience of all those astonishing overawing comets that bristled across the sky during the first four decades of his life. That was what encouraged him towards the abysses of time, the abysses of space, which moved him into such a typically late Victorian phase of agnostic pessimism by the end of the century of the early 20th century. <clears throat> a couple of questions about all this. The first of them is straightforward. Why does all this matter? And next, I suppose, a, another similar question. Why am I telling you all this? This is a question any lecturer should face up sooner or later in the course of any discussion. It obviously matters in one way, because it explains a lot to me about Thomas Hardy, but it matters I think because it's also pretty typical of the way that literary imagination was moving by the end of the 19th century, and possibly imagination more generally. If we turn for a moment to Virginia Woolf, the great doyenne of early 20th century fiction in English, Virginia Woolf was a tremendous fan of Thomas Hardy. She read Two in a Tower in 1908, Ten years later, in her own early novel, Night and Day, she still talks about how <clears throat> the stars work upon the mind and froze to cinders the whole of our short human history. Ten years after that, in the wave, she was still talking about the world moving through abysses of infinite space, lost 
lost in the abysses of time in the darkness. Another 10 years nearly further on in between the acts, one of her characters is called Mrs. Swithin, a kind of reference back to Hardy. She is interested in the work of Sir James Jeans. Sir James Jeans, if you like, is the Patrick Moore of the 1930s. One of them, Patrick Moore turns up in his guys once every 50 years, like Doctor Who, I guess. James Jeans was a great popularizer of contemporary ideas about astronomy. He was also a fairly serious astronomer. He was interested in the work of Edwin Hubble on galaxies, which of course was quite recent, partly through Hubble's work showing that galaxies were receding from each other with increasing and unbelievable speed. He reflected in two of his books, The Universe Around Us, The Mysterious Universe, a pair of genes, if you like. He expressed the universe consists in the main of desolate emptiness, inconceivably vast stretches of desert space, indifferent to life like our own. That book, The Mysterious Universe, had gone through nine editions by 1934. That's how popular it was. In 1934, the American poet Robert Frost could assume everybody would know what he meant when he talked about the ultimate loneliness of empty spaces between stars and stars where no human race is. That, um, if you like, is a steady a representation of a steady expansion in the speaking loneliness of the universe between, if you like, the 1880s or perhaps the 1850s and the 1930s. It's a real transition, isn't it, from those friendly stars that appeared at the beginning of Far From the Madding Crowd. They were still romantic, they were still beautiful, they were still friendly, they were still intimate. By 1930s, there could be nothing more alarming or nothing more daunting than empty spaces between, between stars. It's therefore worth asking if I'm suggesting such a big transition in thinking and also trying to say that comets and their astonishing and awesome apparitions had such a big part in it, it's worth asking why so many comets did appear between 1843 and 1882. What explanation could there be for that? If I was a really serious Thomas Hardyist, I could very cheekily say, well, the, the imminent will sent them. Whatever dark force rules the universe, reckon that the late Victorians needed to be nudged a bit further towards um, agnostic pessimism. So the imminent will sent down a herd of terrifying comments to move people into thinking in a different way. Slightly more plausibly than that, there could have been, I suppose, a wandering star that dithered past the Oort cloud generations before and dislodged a number of comets which arrived together in surprisingly short order, possible. A little bit more plausibly still, it's worth noticing that at least two of those comets, the one in 1843 and the one in 1882, they were so-called Kreutz sun grazers. And I'm sure you know that these are comets which at perihelion whip around the sun extraordinarily closely and quickly. They are thought to be, presumably by Herr Kreutz, they are thought to be relics of one enormous originary object. So that there was one massive comet which broke up and the fragments have continued to follow slightly, slightly broadly similar orbits. And I guess therefore might turn up fairly sharply one after the other. But probably the best explanation, you know what, is, is just chance. It's just chance that um, those comets appeared. I'm sure any statistician who's listening is already thinking that there is perhaps nothing that strange about five of the brightest comets in history appearing in the space of 40 years. It still seems kind of odd to me, largely because of, in the light of really of the darkness of what's what, what followed, that after 1882, there wasn't really a major comet until 1910, and that was when Halley came back. There was also a daylight comet in January that year, which is pretty spectacular too. But after that, there was nothing much at all until 1957, at which point comet Arendt Roland turned up. Arndt Roland doesn't really look like that much of a comet, although I believe it had an interesting anti-tail, which doesn't appear in this picture, so this may not be its best profile. 
But I'm not too worried about that because I have a personal, I, I think it'd be fair to say, I have a personal grievance against this comet, whose nature I will explain to you. When comet Aaron Rowland appeared in 1857, I was around three years old, pretty much Thomas Hardy's age, when the Great Comet of 1843 showed up. The difference is the Great Comet of 1843 was great, and this one wasn't. And I remember vividly in 1957, numerous adults pointing to the sky and saying to me, look, look, can you see it? And unfortunately, none of them actually explained what I was looking for. I just kept saying, can you see it? I became so exasperated, I eventually just said, yes, yeah, yeah. But ever since then, I felt bereft that I had this fantastic chance to see a comet when I was really small. I blew it. And as a result, I ever since, for the rest of my life, been passionately committed to finding any comet I possibly could. As a result of which, I have struggled to see Ikei Seki, Hayaku Taki, Halley, Holmes, Lovejoy, Fan Stars. And in fairness, I probably have seen them all. And I have to say, I found them all fairly disappointing. And I guess that's partly to do with the fact that um, streetlights, those same streetlights that bother the Hardys, that Piazzi Smith was sensitive to, that Mr. Wilfred de Fungvi evaded in his balloon. It's not easy to see comets decently from a city, which is mostly where I've lived. And I know what you're thinking. I must have welcomed, in the end, redemption when Hale Bob showed up. And I have to say, Hale Bob did its best. I appreciated it. It was good. It was certainly visible. But it, I, it, it somehow, it just wasn't the same as that one, you know? Hale Bob, even at its best, just didn't look like the Great Comet of 1843 or any of the others. And of course, my grief about this has not abated during the 21st century. And for that reason, and because I'm prepared to clutch even at crumbs of comfort, I was terribly pleased when Comet Neowise turned up last summer. For two reasons, really, and I'll, I'll get on to the second one, which is possibly more interesting, but the main one was, it was just very easy to spot. You might remember that um, our President Andrew sent us these pictures, I think shared us uh, pictures with us. First of all, a picture taken, I think, if I, I remember rightly, from Blackford Hills, gone out as a proper astronomer, set up, seen um, Neowise. But then discovered that when he went home, Comet Neowise looked nearly as good from his bedroom window. And that <clears throat> was an experience which I rather shared, that my own Comet picture um, came from a bedroom window as well. No, never go to bed without a telephoto lens. It is slightly magnified. Um, and, and that was the great thing about it. At least it wasn't, it wasn't the great comet of 1843, but it was definitely a comet and it was there and I saw it and I know I saw it. So, so far, so good. The second thing I really liked about it, I'm going to go back if I can to Andrew's pictures. I like it better. The second thing I really liked about it was that it reminded me very much of Tebbit's Comet in 1881. Why? Because it showed up in almost exactly the same part of the sky. It appeared very close to the bright star Capella in the constellation of Auriga when it first appeared. It gradually tracked westward during July towards the plow. It was the same trajectory. It was also kind of the same experience, wasn't it, of trying to spot it against midsummer midnight twilight. It wasn't altogether easy until about one in the morning. That was rather like the experience of Comet Tebbit, which most people, even those crowds in London, had to stay up pretty late to see. There was no British summer time in those days, but they were still having to stay up till 12 or 1 in the morning. So if you like, <clears throat> this comet Neowise transported me back to 1881. and also started me thinking about how comets connect up different periods of time. And I know, of course, perfectly well that Neowise wasn't the return of Comet Tebbit at all. I recall Mark telling us that Neowise won't come back for 6,000 years. Comet Tebbit was due back in 2,000 years, or I guess now 1,850 times moved on. But also, even though this wasn't the same object, it started me thinking about how comets extend and stretch imagination into utterly different epochs of time deepening our sense of time in doing so. So to move on back or move back 
When Richard Proctor comments in Comets in the 1870s, he wasn't sure if they were interstellar objects or, or if they were solar system ones, but he accepted that once they were in closed orbits, that's to say within the solar system, as he commented, the mind shrinks utterly before the contemplation of the vastness of the time intervals which have elapsed since those journeyings first commenced. And it was that mind shrinking near infinitude of cometary excursions into the future or returns from the past, which I'm interested in in terms of its effect on anybody's imagination, certainly on literary imagination. Thomas Hardy, again, was very aware of that stretching into the future. This is the poem he wrote 99% certainly, I think, when he saw Donati's comet and, and commented in his poem, it bends far over Yellum Plain, and we from Yellum Height stand and regard its fiery train so soon to swim from sight. It will return long years hence when, as now, its strange swift shine will fall in Yellum, but not in that sweet form of thine. So hardy in that, oh, hardy in that poem thinking about a future <clears throat> bereft of the humanity that so approximately appeals to him at the time, the time of looking at them. We don't know who he's talking about, possibly his sister in 1858. He would have been 18, who, who knows. But it was thinking about how comets stretch Hardy's imagination into a future that would no longer be populated by the mortals whom he knew and loved. It also started me thinking about another um, late Victorian, early modern writer, and that's H.G. Wells. And I, I promise that um, I won't occupy us with H.G. Wells for more than another five minutes. Be patient, I've, I've almost finished. But I couldn't resist mentioning Wells because Wells was 15 or 16 years old when those comets turned up in the early 1880s, um, Comet Tedet and then the Great September Comet. He described himself as being at a receptive age. He had just assembled and reassembled an old astronomical telescope. He'd been looking at Jupiter and its moons. Maybe some of that inspiration remained 25 years later when he produced this novel in the days of the comet. And I would love to tell you what a fantastic astronomical novel this is, except it isn't actually. What it uses the comet for is a convenient plot device which works rather like the comet wine I described fertilizing, or, or the cometary influence fertilizing French vineyards. Wells postulates an enormous comet which thunders over the earth and drops some strange kind of oofal dust, which completely intoxicates humanity and forces it to turn itself into the kind of political system that H.G. Wells happened to have been advocating all his life. The people suddenly under the aegis of the comet start living in a utopian ideal political society. They start loving each other and living beautiful lives. The comet really is only there to turn that hinge for, uh, for, for um, Wells' imagination, although there are some fine descriptions nevertheless of the comet approaching the Earth. What really interests me therefore is not so much in the days of the comet, though it shows us that Wells was sort of comet savvy. It's the H.G. Wells started writing time travel stories pretty shortly after those comets showed up. By 1888, H.G. Wells was writing the chronic Argonauts, chronic in time sense, not chronic in any other sense, <laughs> short story in 1888. Much more famously, of course, seven years later in 1895, the time machine, the one that we all know about. And you remember from the time machine, how the time traveler moves into an infinitely far distant future, an unimaginable millions of years in the future. The earth has become unimaginably desolate. It's turned into an entropic wilderness in which nothing is recognizable except an enormous glaring and large dying sun, a few strange crustacean crab-like creatures that are pincering about um, around a darkling ocean. The only thing that remains recognizable, really, either for the time traveler or for us, is what? Comets. He looks up, and because of the speed of his machine, he still sees comets whizzing across the sky, glaring across the darkling sky, is, is the phrase. 
For me, that might be a little clue that what allowed Wells's imagination to so flourish by extending itself into unimaginable reaches of time might partly at least have been inspired by the same mind-shrinking or mind-expanding encounters with comets that Richard Proctor vividly described. Whether or not, the time machine is an interesting symptom, I think, of where late 19th and early 20th century imagination had got to. At the end of the 18th century, a lot of people, perhaps most people, believed that the world was as much as 6,000 years old. By the end of the 19th century, time had immeasurably stretched into unimaginable eons, astonishing depths of, of time as well as of space. But interestingly, too, at that moment, time was shrinking as well. Time under the pressure of an industrial age was extraordinarily minute and divisive. Anybody working with a railway timetable, which was anybody, anybody clocking in for factory work had to be aware of minutes and seconds in a way that certainly wouldn't have been the case 100 years earlier. Time, in other words, to borrow that phrase from the man hanging off the cliff, Time was opening and closing like a fan for these people at this moment. And that opening and closing, those contrary uneasy pressures about temporality, have a huge role to play in the kind of early 20th century um, modernist fiction that was being written by Virginia Woolf. It would be really good to tell you more about that, but having mentioned a time machine, as promised, I am going to draw to a close, but I can't resist returning almost to where I began, which is that fantastic authority, the Edinburgh Evening News. Let's have another look at it. The Edinburgh Evening News, 24th June, 1881, as well as saying what a wonderful spectacle comments were. It reported, large numbers appreciate the poetic effect of the appearance of a comet. One good look at a large comet is a thing to be welcomed and remembered. Comets may be regarded as a means of registering the progress of human culture and the scientific spirit. I agree with every word of that. The, the Evening News was a serious journal in those days. Large numbers appreciate the poetic effect. There is an inherent poetic effect in comets because they break up the established order. When we think we know the patterns of the stars, the star be dead, suddenly something astonishing comes to make us think again. The one good look at a large comet is a thing to be welcomed. Well, I'll say it is. Bring it on. Bring me back a great daylight comet in the next 10 years or so, and I still have a chance to see it. A thing to be welcomed and remembered, but also we may think comets may be regarded as a means of registering the progress of human culture and the scientific spirit. That's kind of what I've been trying to say, that we can learn a lot by looking at cometary appearances and what was happening at the time. But as well as registering, I would almost change that word to propelling, that comments may be regarded as a means of propelling the progress of human imagination, culture, and scientific understanding. It is that astonishing effect to walk out, not just once, but five times, look at the sky and think, this is unbelievable. That propels culture, prepares, propels science in all sorts of ways. I'm not for a moment saying that the Victorian age was completely transformed by comets alone. There were tons of other factors, obviously. The philosophy of Schopenhauer, the ideas of Darwin, the industrial age, which I just mentioned. But I am saying that there was a significant place that all these cometary imagination, a cometary apparition should occupy in the history of the period. So I'm going to finish with an emblem of the late Victorian age for us. Thomas Hardy was an architect's assistant as well as a, an author. He was an architectural um, trainee before anything else. He was a good draftsman and he drew this comment for his poem, The Sign Seeker, published in 1898. It seems to me an emblem of the changes that were wrought in late Victorian imagination by astonishing commentary apparitions. That's what I came to tell you. Thank you for listening so patiently. Uh, Randall, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. It's an insightful, informative, and, and entertaining uh, talk as we've ever, ever had. Perhaps members could put their hands together and show their appreciation. Wonderful. Um, now, uh, we've got quite an international audience as well as a fairly large national audience. Um, 
for questions. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you can put them in the chat uh, box. That'd be fine. We'll pick those up. If you're looking on YouTube and you're watching the live show um, and you want to put a question on the comment section, then we'll try and pick up uh, as many as we can. Okay. Uh, questions. Okay, okay Andrew. Uh, Thanks very much for that talk, Rad. That was brilliant. Loved it. Uh, I'll go to Jim first, and then back to Mark and Hillary, okay? Because Mark's mm -hmm. got a comment, and Hillary's got a question. So, Jim? Yeah, uh, thanks, Randall. That was a, a fascinating education of, between the intersection of uh, li literature and science. And I, I, I was wondering, you know, when you were talking about late 19th century, early 20th century, we, we've got this idea of the stereotypical well-read Victorian who had interests in a wide range of, of topics. I'm wondering if this is reflected in, in, in the work of these authors, that it's, it's their interest in all things. Yeah, I think that, that it's hard to answer comparatively because the world we live in now is so well informed with internet and television. You know, the, the sky at night has probably informed people as well or better than Richard Proctor did in the late 19th century. And there have been so many demographic shifts too that the number of people who could now tell you how the solar system works, I'm sure is immensely greater than would have been the case in 1880. On the other hand, there was certainly a bunch of people in the 1880s who exactly as you described would have kind of tried to know everything. You know, they would have read Darwin as Hardy did they would perhaps have read Richard Proctor as Hardy did. They would also have read Tennyson, whom I didn't mention except as the referee. There was a lot of astronomy in Tennyson's poetry, and he was picking that up from contemporary accounts as well. So I think that's, for me, a, a, good, a good point of approach to the late Victorian period, that there were a number of authors and general public who lived in a quite rich um, environment of knowledge. I think the other thing, which is really off to one side from your question, the gentleman astronomer was a real thing in those days. You know, the guys like that Dr. Henry Thompson were just about as well equipped in a way, as, not as Greenwich, but they've got fantastic gear. Um, Tebbit, John Tebbit is a fascinating figure in Australia. Eventually he had his own observatory, which he built with his own hands. There was that sort of sense in those days that you could go out and be a significant scientist almost just by wanting to. You know, you could start with a one and a half inch refractor and pretty soon you could be revolutionizing cometary science. So in that way, it's a very attractive period, I guess, in some ways, although I, I rather like the democracy of modern knowledge systems too. I did put a sort of second point in the chat that actually speaks to the current position. We may all be better informed through the, the, de the democracy of the internet, but our authors are as, if you like, um, uh, right in the same way that those late Victorian authors wrote in, in their wonder of science or uh, current, current day topics. Mm. Well, I think it's quite hard to. I mean, there's an Ian McEwan novel, I'll remember which one in a minute, in which he wants, it's the child in time probably, but he wants to start addressing current theories of quantum mechanics and post-relativistic physics. And the only way he can really do that is by having a conversation between his protagonist and, and the quantum mechanician. And, and the, the protagonist says, can you explain this to me? And then there are paragraphs in the novel. In other words, knowledge itself, particularly astronomical knowledge, is now sufficiently more esoteric. It's actually something perhaps harder to work into fiction. People were, at the time, enormously interested in Einstein. I'm not sure Einstein was exactly an influence in the 1920s, but you could make a case for it. As we move further forward, there are people like Jeanette Winterson or McEwen who are interested in Stephen Hawking, and have obviously read it and know about it. But I think it's, it's maybe what you're actually pointing us towards is that there was a brief kind of heroic age in the late Victorian period, not that I'm a fan of the late Victorian period, but there was an excitement about ideas, which was possibly more universally shareable than mm. the case. 
Thanks for that, Randall. Can we go off to Hilary for, for, for a question? And Mark's got something to tell us. Randall, thank you. I really enjoyed that. It was great, great to hear. It was great to get a different perspective on the 19th century because what I remember of it from school is learning the dates um, 1832 and 1867 and, and 1881, I think, as, as Reform Act dates. So it's nice to have a, a new set of dates. Mm. Um, and the, the other thing that I always associate the 19th century with is thinking that my um, astronomer husband would have been quite happy there as a kind of, if, if he could have been a, a gentleman astronomer and kind of take part in, in that kind of, that kind of, kind of world. Um, but my question is simply, if you had H.G. Wells's time machine, would you go back to 1842 um, to see the, if it was 1842, to see the Great Comet, or would you use it for something else? <laughs> um... I would use it um, several times to go back and visit the 1843 comet, the 1858 comet, the 1860. I would go back to visit any of those comets. Yes, I mean it's a lovely idea. I don't think I want to go back and live then. I actually am not at all a 19th century person. I've always worked in the 20th century, and for a long time I always lived in the 20th century until they changed it to the 21st. I've got no real ambition to, to go back and live in anybody else's century. But yes, I mean, I love your idea. If I could get in a time machine tonight, you can absolutely believe I would go back to the March 1843 and I would just be so happy. I would feel that all my childish childhood disappointments from 1957 would be completely wiped away. Thank you. If you ever have a spare time machine, send, send it round. <laughs> Will do. Um, my, my comment was Sir James Jeans was the first person to receive the Laura Medal from our society, the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, in mm. 1938. So he was the first Laura Medalist. Mm. Yeah. He's really good value and very interesting historically. And I'm glad he got the medal. <laughs> um, the, the books are still, I think, very good. And actually, sometimes they throw up things. I would like somebody to explain to me more. Apparently, an astronomer in the 30s, Vicky by name, he's quite a famous astronomer, suggested that the redshift wasn't caused by what we think the redshift is caused by, but it's actually caused by gravitational refraction. So what we now think of as gravitational lensing, he was trying to use to explain the whole redshift phenomenon. I assume this is wrong, but um, it, nevertheless, it's interesting to think about because, you know, when we think about using dark matter as the only explanation, I might just go back to, to Zvicky for an alternative view. Thank you. Well, Peter? That's all the questions uh, on the, the chat box, so over to YouTube. Mark, do you see any questions there? We've had some... Um... Good um, banter and response from YouTube. I'll uh, start with a, a question from David Levy. Wonderful, inspiring lecture. Comets at Yaleham especially moving. But of, his question is, of all the comets you have seen, which was your favourite one? <laughs> well, I have to say it was Neowise by quite a long way. I, I think it's, again, it's possibly just to do with the time of life really that when Hale Bob showed up I seem to remember being terribly busy and I never got to look at it properly you know it was always up there and I thought I'll get it tomorrow whereas Neowise was a bit more precious it obviously wasn't going to be bright enough to last for a long time and I kind of I, I mean I just liked Andrew's story so much you make all this effort to go out and look for a comet then you find it's in your back garden or, or it's really there it was so accessible so I guess you know the sensible answer is to say Hale Bob because it was thoroughly impressive. You didn't even really need to go out of Edinburgh to see the complexity of it. It had a dust tail, it had an iron tail, and even I think you could just about see a gas tail. So that, that one is certainly up there. But um, at the moment, maybe, I, maybe I'm just, um, I'm, I'm so shallow that I just go for the most recent comment. So Neowise, Neowise for me, for now. Well, our president's promised another one this year, so... <laughs> you, you've had your quota. Uh, any more, Will? Yeah, I, I'd actually just like to say, uh, uh, there was a couple of banter comments here. One was from Byron, Brian, by Byron Farrell, just remarking that there isn't um, much talk about um, comets sort of, fate, you know, sort of uh, giving the Earth a fret 
with their speed. And, um, and it was actually David Levy that remarked um, that um, if, you, if we remember in 1993, that of course the comet which crashed into Jupiter was traveling at such a great speed and mm -hmm. you know, it would have covered the United, United States in about 70 seconds, gives you United mm -hmm. the speed. And of course that comet was called Comet Shoemaker Levy yeah. 9. I'd just like yeah. to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Got, a, yeah. um, got a question from um, Conundrum Esoterica who asked if you've actually read um, a comet in Moominland book. <laughs> Yes. And if, if you've read yes. that, and what your thoughts were on this? Uh, very affirmative. I, I both have read Comet in Moominland and like it very much. And as it happens, another starting point for tonight's lecture, rather oddly and unexpectedly, was a friend in Sweden who's producing a book of literary essays about comets and has got one from a very talented graduate student about comets in Moominland and asked me if I'd like to be part of the book which I thought I would and started from there. So if you like, Comets in the Moomin Land is really the lead point for tonight's lecture, not subsidiary at all. Um, and I have read the essay about Comets in the Moomin Land. It is very good. And yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm honored to be part of this book. I'm not dead confident it will ever get published, but if it ever does, you may be sure <laughs> I will deposit a copy with anybody who wants one, or I will put up an advert saying, for only a dozen kroner or whatever they have in Sweden, you can, you can have me and comments <laughs> in Womenland in, in the same volume. Yeah. No, I recommend that it. it's a great children's story. It's great fun. And um, that's really it. But overall response from YouTube and, and obviously myself, was absolutely fantastic lecture, Randall. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, uh, I'd echo that. And uh, I'll declare an interest. That was my son, Byron, in Romania, who must have sent that one in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Look, once again, uh, Randall, can we just uh, thank you in the normal way? Thank you. Wonderful, and we'll, we'll have a sequel before too long, if that's all right. Wait for the next comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, now, we, we happen to have um, uh, been alerted to uh, Nova um, recently, and Alan's just going to say one or two words on that before we clap. Over to you, Alan. Right, hi. Hi, folks. Let me switch to screen one and share that. Oops. Can you see that? Mm. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. A chart that I prepared this uh, afternoon when I, after I heard about this new Nova that's appeared in Cassiopeia, Nova Cassiopeia. Excuse me. Um, I, 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 has your screen gone the same as mine? Can, can you see it, Mark? Yeah, it's yeah. looking fine. Right. It's fine, yeah. Okay. Right. Good. I heard about it this afternoon. Uh, a Nova di discovered in Cassiopeia. In fact, uh, around noon yesterday from Japan, when it was uh, a faint object, magnitude 8.9, I think it was. Uh, but it's been brightening since then. The latest uh, message I've seen on the AA VSO website is that it was magnitude 7.8 as of uh, 6.30 this evening. So it's it's been brightened by more than a magnitude in, in, in a day. Uh, and it's possibly still brightening, uh, though whether it'll become naked eye is, is doubtful. It lies in Cassiopeia. There's the the chair of, can you see my pointer? Yeah. Yes. My hand, yeah. Uh, the chair of, of Cassiopeia. And if you take a line from Shadow to Calf and extend it a bit further than that, then that's where the Nova is located. I've, I've enlarged that particular bit of Stellarium's plot here. And if I can be clever, I can switch over to the Stellarium itself. There we are. That's the, the, uh, the view. Um, uh, that's that's a, my image of Stellarium. Can you see that now? Yes. Yeah, OK. The Nova is not labelled, but it's, it's in that bullseye right in the middle there. And it's quite close to a couple of interesting uh, objects. One of them is the Bubble Nebula, which is Caldwell 11. So if you want to combine it with a shot of Caldwell 11 or NGC 7635, uh, then uh, you, you can do so. 
And it's also uh, just about 28 arc minutes south of this object, which is labeled in Stellarium as Cassiopeia Salt and Pepper Cluster, but you may know it better as M52. Um, it's also called the October Salt and Pepper Cluster or the Scorpion Cluster or NGC 7654. It's about uh, uh, magnitude 6.9. So, uh, and it's, it's situated there. Uh, the first reports had it about 1.3 seconds away from a Gaia star. But then uh, we're looking at astronomical telegram more recently. Uh, the, now it's claimed that it actually is this Gaia star that uh, is about magnitude 15 and is a known uh, variable star, a known W uh, uh, Majoris variable star, two stars going around each other every, every nine hours. So it looks like uh, this is the 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 the, uh, the source of the nova explosion, and novae occur when uh, one of a pair of uh, a binary star, um, a, a white dwarf star, receives material from its neighbour, and the material builds up until eventually it flares and ignites nu nuclear fusion, and the star brightens uh, quite rapidly, quite quickly, and uh, how long it'll be bright for, no one knows could be just a few days, it could be a few weeks. And as I say, it may still be brightening. So if it were clear tonight and you can see Cassiopeia, which is in the north, north, west, getting lower in the evening, then, uh, then uh, it's a good thing to look at. Um, the star is thought to be, uh, that exploded is thought to be five and a half thousand light years away. So, uh, and I say, it's, it's just to the south of, of M52. Okay, and M52 is 500 light years away, by the way. <laughs> so um, take a look for that Nova. Um, it lies, as you can see, in this milky background of the Milky Way. We get most Novae and supernovae uh, in the Milky Way because that's where the greatest concentration of dim stars, candidate stars, lie. Uh, it's not a supernova. There was someone suggesting it was a supernova. <laughs> looking at Andrew here, <laughs> <laughs> but a supernova is a much more catastrophic catastrophic ex, ex, explosion of a star. Uh, this nova will eventually settle down and it may flare up again in a few tens or hundreds of years, uh, may be recurrent in the long run, uh, but uh, it's something to look out for at the moment. Right, thanks. It was turning cheek. I, I, I say, Alan. <laughs> I know, Andrew. I do know that you did say. That. <laughs> well, thank you, Alan. That's uh, it was just an opportune moment, and um, I think we'll have something on the website um, to um, probably our chart to to help anybody who uh, wants to look at it in more detail at their leisure. Right. I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay. There we go. Um, and I think uh, that's it. Other than to say uh, again, thank you very much, Randall. Um, that was an excellent talk. I, I think we've really shown just how much they enjoyed that. Just a nice different take on our, our normal routine. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, um, I hope to see you all.